Hello everyone, today we talk again about the Franks and Clovis that you like so much, as I know from my analytics here. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk about Merovingian history because uh, it's really one of those chapters in, you know, in Western culture that the more you learn about and the more they reveal their importance, really. I made a video I think it was three years ago, in which um, I talked about the balance of power that occurred, especially around the 30s of the 6th century, between the Franks, the Goths, and the Byzantines. Um, that is perhaps a, um, a follow-up uh, to this topic, uh, today's topic, let's say, um, and can help understanding better the difference that the Franks made uh, which is often overlooked as if, you know, the Franks were just, after all, some other people of the many that fundamentally occupied the areas of the former Western Roman Empire and were pretty much uh, the same thing. And in a sense, they were as Franks, right? Uh, the distinction is properly to be made with the Merovingian dynasty and its establishment that changed an enormous deal of thing. When we look about the Merovingian Empire that eventually came to be uh, this, as we will see partly now, and not just a mere, a mere kingdom, there is, if you ever found some historiographical um, difference in this in, in terminology, just be aware that it, that it stems from this, from the fact that the Franks managed to subjugate other peoples, right, that were not uh, incorporated within the Frankish kingdom, but they were factually under Frankish domination, as in an imperial form, right? And this way before Carolingian times. In fact, another, yet another thing that is somewhat overlooked, and thanks to the brilliant uh, Carolingian and papal propaganda, it was surely extremely effective and powerful and uh, extraordinary. Essentially, what we see in the Carolingian world was created exclusively by the Merovingians, right? Because there is practically, except the the imperial, the, the Roman imperial crowning, um, factually nothing that the Carolingians didn't use in everything, including their own same propaganda that was, wasn't in fact created by the Merovingians. Today we don't talk about the Merovingian kingdom, which is also odd because, you know, in, in medieval manuals where I draw, let's say, the, the inspiration for... Um, uh, topics of this at least this at this level of um of explanation then you know in the in-depth things it's even more difficult to 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 focus but very often the uh, on the wall i mean the the franks are this beginning the sixth century clovis obviously but then you know yes at some point something happened in between and then the pippinids charlemagne etc instead there is a whole lot of things going on properly in Merovingian history that I never discussed here, so we will have to start at some point. I think we can start from the historical regions uh, series, uh, talking, for example, about the differences between Neustria and Austrasia that made up the Frankish kingdom, um, and reflecting even in there on important differences existing between the two, the two regions. Um, but there is an aspect that is overlooked also in the in the passage, this is at least uh, a concern that I've always had ever since I began to study thoroughly uh, medieval history. It is to say, how did the Franks make it? I mean, what what's, was there about the Franks that really took them to that imperial grandeur that, say, the Alamanni didn't have or the Saxons didn't have? This is um, an important question that can be of course, easily explained uh, at a certain level, but it, it it's not obvious, right? And still depends on an, inter an historical interpretation that that requires a political and military understanding rather than a broader, you know, mechanistic and almost deterministic one. Because you soon realize that the Franks themselves weren't initially anything special. There was nothing distinctive about them. E even their name, which is probably, but I don't think there is a, a whole certainty of this one, the idea of being free, or at least it was this, you know, uh, 
generic sh international shout out like the the Alamanni, like uh, other peoples that simply m stress the fact that these were actually tribes, right? Not peoples, right? They were tribes joining together in a confederal sense, and the Franks being especially very jealous of these freedoms. So this clashes dramatically with what the Franks m m became under the Merovingians, even assuming we can't talk about Franks only, because at that point we are looking at a perfect combination of Gallo-Roman Germanic culture. I made an important amount of videos, not just on the migration here in this sense, but also in the relation between Romans and Germans that seems to be uh, you know, such uh, a complicated topic to understand nowadays because still there are ethno-nationalistic uh, issues with this concept that have nothing to do, however, with the historical reality exactly because the overwhelming success of the Merovingian dynasty I made a video recently titled How the Franks Essentially uh, Surpassed the Gods in the Direction the hege Hegemonic Direction of Europe were ruling over, in fact, a pre-existing power it was essentially Roman Gaul and had understood how to integrate successfully their own people, their own elite, their own hierarchy with the very powerful Gallo-Roman ones, especially the Episcopal ones that ruled the land and acquiring therefore in one shot without any further complication especially connected to religious issues like instead went forever on uh, and significantly crippling even the potential of these powers like you know among the Visigoths um, and uh, even the Vandals it, it depends really because that's also been uh, perhaps overtly stressed as a even in fact as a theological deep cultural problem it, 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 it's more strictly political in a sense but uh, we've seen of course how Clovis conversion was essentially the uh, the gateway to this and how this man definitely owns a, a, an enormous place in, in world history, easily as consequential, if not more, on the longer run, of course, at that point, indirectly, than Constantine. And Constantine was, was a Roman emperor from a system that was also, you know, at that point, incredibly more unitary and larger. Clovis was just, you know, one of the many Frankish chieftains. Like, he and he rose to f fundamentally an imperial level of course in a we in a, in a context like the the late 5th early 6th century was very difficult for everybody involved um, the the roman empire in the west w was settled by germanic peoples that however as we've seen could have not ruled without the local population by any stretch of the imagination i mean just look at the demographic ratios but that were also not faring particularly well at all. On the contrary, quite of the reason for which they moved in the first place was that they weren't faring well at all, um, nor their stay was easy, as also their demographic, in fact, power base also as properly um, manpower was, was very limited. The Visigoths still by the 60s of the, of the 5th century risked to be wiped out by the Western Roman Empire. Um, the same, in a way, was true for the Vandals, that, however, did manage to make a difference. In fact, Geyseric being, after, sure, after Alaric, Theodoric, Clovis, probably one of the, the great, surely among them, one of the greatest um, Germanic kings of the time, that really changed history. Because if, if the Western Empire actually ended it, it because of him, solely, in a sense, at least uh, he made the difference in that context, and without Geyseric at the time of the Islamic invasions, assuming they, they would have happened, uh, the Arabs would have found still a Western Roman Empire instead at the time. Um, the point is, however, how the step was made. I made many, uh, by Clovis, I made many videos, as, as I said, that are also importantly watched. The, the key there is Merovingian, right? People watch Frankish history videos, etc., but uh, mostly the the key for which, because I think there is not much in on YouTube with that name is Merovingian. Um, but I talk about properly Clovis and his rise to power, also about the early Franks by a certain degree. So I won't be repeating myself too much regarding uh, 
Clovis and his uh, extraordinary, the, the, the mythology that has been built around him that, you know, can be fictional by a certain extent, but still in, in that context is perfectly coherent and plausible. And we want to believe it's, 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 it's real in, in, in that sense, because in that world we know that such things did happen, and that, that mindset was exactly the one that was painted. Of course, there are lots of things we don't know either, and things went less romantically, especially in a, in a much more traumatically, ruthlessly, and believe me, in a way completely deprived of any form of human mercy. Uh, that you can imagine, because without that, there's no civilization by a, a certain extent. Um, but they made it. I mean, Clovis, again, starting as a... Yes, it was a powerful chieftain, but it began probably with, you know, with a retinue of not more than, you know, several hundred men, to basically behead, literally, uh, all the rest of Fra the Frankish uh, chieftains, nobility, if you want, to crush... Uh, as we will see now, other peoples in battle and s crippling them to the point of collapsing under Frankish domination and establishing a power, especially in Gaul, which was one of the most ideologically solid ever built and that had basically a, a legacy of millennia that uh, can still be seen in Europe because of what, in fact, the Franks brought Europe to be, right? And um, it's an enormous balance. It, it's just, again, um, a chieftain with, with, with a bodyguard of hundreds, just a few hundreds men, basically creating the single greatest power in Romano-Germanic Europe and managing fundamentally to hegemonize uh, the western half of the continent. Um, by confirming his own blood and dynasty and monarchy, which was uh, an incredibly, um, you know, breaking uh, f um, ins political institutional form compared to what the Franks had ever been habituated to, right? And that was drawing dramatically, of course, from Roman legitimization, not just because Clovis got baptized uh, ba as a Roman Catholic and... Um, you know, establishing also millennia uh, 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 long uh, ties with, between the Frankish and the Roman Church, uh, and of course being supported by the incredibly powerful, both morally and materially powerful, um, Gallo Roman clergy that ruled the land um, quite concretely, uh, but also the, the vicary of Gaul from, from, from Constantinople. And an enormous uh, s set of other uh, ideological support that we have seen, for example, in the video about the sacralization of the Merovingian monarchy, that stressed brilliantly this um, bond between uh, Frankish uh, existential bloodthirstiness that continued with human sacrifices even up to the seventh century, where in theory they were Christians, to the passion of Christ, essentially centering. The, the truest meaning of, of it, that is a struggle, a fight, a cosmic war that Christ was suffering in blood, right? Rising across in blood. In fact, that's the subtitle of that video. And chanting properly the sacrifice of the blood, which the, the Franks were literally obsessed with uh, to the point that historiography talks about anematophilia. Right, these people were fr got frenzied and you know exalted at the sight of blood, um, because it it um, it incarnated literally the imperium, as that blood was shed and had allowed them to objectively conquer this enormous Atlantic plains stretching from the Pyrenees to to the Evesa, uh, and and uh, crushing this uh, formidable set of enemies by receiving, again, the legitimization, the confirmation of, of, of Roman and Catholic power on a universal scale. And that's how that universal character was deeply imbued in, in Frankish mindset, because it was very early on a dynastic one, one based on the idea, of course, that the stronger uh, rules by divine faculty, because he proves that, and that... Um, this connection uh, 
uh, this somatic connection, genetic connection among the kins, is destined to repristinate an order that is the one of, of the golden age that already uh, Augustus had achieved and that at that point had been lost and that the Franks for which saw themselves just as the Jews and the Romans and were not convinced, they, they simply knew to be the chosen people had conquered the world accordingly, so would the Franks in a in a very peculiar way, but um, say formally in ways that um, are difficult to explain in a modern and secular sense, but if one looks at properly the Frankish legacy in Europe, realizes to be primal, properly in, in the narrow concept, let's say, of, of Europe in itself you know, as a Western concept, which uh, uh, took really a form under the, the Merovingian and later Carolingian empires and their successors. This concept is, as you understand, of enormous uh, scale. Like it's it's uh, uh, one the the problem of the origins is always, in my opinion, in fact, seminal, more important than, than anything else. Um, and this is all more extraordinary if you understand the international situation of the time. That's why I referred before to that video about the balance between the Franks, the the Gauls, and the Byzantines, because Interestingly enough, the Goths were making an experiment on their own based on Arianism and on Germanism that, in this sense, the Merovingians opposed in a more Catholic and Roman way, so much that they were allies with Constantinople because of this big axis in between that didn't include just the Goths of Italy, Illyricum, Noricum, uh, and the Iberian Peninsula and the uh, Western Mediterranean islands, but um, also Central Europe, because the pagan Germans that inhabited in, in actually just east of the Franks, and that were in fact siding with the Goths exactly because of this, because they feared Merovingian expansionism, supported, because they saw in what the Merovingians did through the Christianization of their power and the enormous Roman legacy in their own um, in their own ideology, the uh, threat to their own world. And interestingly enough, Clovis, in my opinion, arises to to a much greater historical scale if you consider, especially the fact that he was by half coming from that world because his mother was. Thuringian. His his father was a Germanic chieftain that had served in the Roman army because it has, the the Franks had always done becoming you know some of the highest uh, Roman officers in Gaul and so also sharing this idea of the emp of empire. Um, Kilperic's grave um, so properly shows that um, I iconology the the idea that Romanity and Germanity on that Rhine frontier had been intensely forged both cooperatively and antagonistically um, and from the other side and and that we're already toying with the idea of, of Christendom Clovis would have initially liked to convert to Arianism also because of his gothic wife um, and he would have not left paganism at some point because his mother was a Thuringian princess and the Thuringians were just would be essentially wiped out by the Franks and the Saxons combined later on. But there were some of the, we went a bit about them, so there were some of the hardest, properly kind of pagan Germanic um, uh, faction, right, and, and stock that would oppose themselves to, to that role. Um, the same can be said for the Alamanni, that in many ways were kind of, we can't say twins with the Franks, but they were pretty much the same. I mean, they, they were both on the Rhine, the border with each other, they, they both interacted with the Romans. The Franks objectively more cooperatively, the, the Alamanni more antagonistically, but the, the let's say, the orientations had changed, uh, had shifted at some point uh, over time. Um, in any case, uh, the Franks won over these peoples, and I think that the the main reason at that point, because there is no other kind of structural reason why this happened, is that is the motivation of Saint Clovis and the fact that he understood at a point clearly that in order to maximize his power, to achieve it, still to by earning it, 
it would have had to unite with the enormously powerful Gallo-Roman uh, politics and society and thus to to verify the nature of, of that truth that was essentially intrinsic in, in the Roman Empire as the power that had conquered the world and now had converted to this new creed that in many ways was however especially in the West heavily infused with the the older universal belief because actually Christianity as Judaism do do stem from a pagan background um, and they just transformed in a kind of monotheistic direction over time as basically all as civilizations do when they become civilizations and so but the meanings are the same right we are the ones who modernistically and secularistically decided that there was a, a dramatic fracture but this thing there wasn't really in that you know also the aforementioned Merovingian ideology uh, regarding the 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 hematophilia with Christ's uh, passion but also with the the true obsession that the Franks had for the Old Testament and uh, the Lord um, God Lord of battles and and this true belief in the fact that victory was to those who would have been faithful to this Lord because it equated to the same faith that the Germanic warriors had in their own chieftains right and so this I heavy idea of hierarchy that was enlarging to the millions uh, uh, of of Gaul um, uh, of Gallo Romans and their structure and, and the pre-existing Roman power the, the, the military that the same Franks crushed ended to crush with Siagris at Soissons etc and inheriting also great part of the infrastructure of the armament of the equipment of the military organization this is particularly true in Clovis um, expeditions against the Visigoths and, and more. It still show, by the way, a late antiquity that was alive, right? Things start shrinking only um, after the Justinian's pandemic, the end of the 6th century, when you realize that of the, I don't know, 30,000 men strong uh, um, Frankish armies at the time of Clovis, Merovingian armies of, the, of his own des of his descendants had become just a hunting parties fundamentally and the same of course kingdom had fragmented in multiple parts because they split it at every generation a lot had changed properly also the system probably exhausted itself because it was also brutally um, impacting um, warfare that at that point was defining this balance between powers so there was not really much better option to, to deplete even part of those resources but still founding an order an equilibrium, a hierarchy, an ideology that survived that same crisis, that survived that same fragmentation. I mean, let's be honest, at the end of the 7th century there was no such thing like a Frankish kingdom anymore. But there was a Merovingian bloodline, and that was sacred, because the, 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 the Merovingians had managed to sum all the, the, the Jewish, the Germanic um, ideology, the holy anointing, uh, the, the old mix, of course, with, with the the Imperium, uh, the Romanian of the Imperium and beyond. Um, and so something truly universal in power that was seen still by in Carolingian times as the, the sole pol possible political institutional base. I mean, uh, the think about um, Pippin uh, the Short, still, uh, Merovingian power did not exist anymore factually there was no consistency to it they had to pick a random guy who was not even a merovingian calling in such kilperic the third and still pretending as a as a as a puppet that it was a merovingian because without that even the very powerful carolingians could not rule and that tells you how much how far how powerful how grand how immense how extraordinary how radical f merovingian uh, ideological, the, the Merovingian ideological formula really was for dominating the world, right? And that's where essentially the Holy Roman Empire also stemmed from, uh, as you know, in, in the uh, succession of the events. And the, the speed, the rapidity, it, it was all about Clovis. You see, if there hadn't been him, uh, the Franks would have just remained one of these scattered um, peoples dominated by uh, petty kings on this northwestern uh, European uh, 
area that would have kept quarreling with their neighbors, would have probably expanded here and there, increasing their power, but remaining uh, something difficultly cohes and, um, you know, also capable of extending their own, their own power beyond. Who knows? Maybe the Anglo-Saxons could have even uh, at some point surpassed them in, in a pressure over the channel or the Alemanni or, or the Saxons or the Thuringians could have established, you know, more sound uh, dominations in, in Central Europe. No, everything changed. And so all history changed because of, of one man, as it often happens. Um, so between insular Europe and the Mediterranean, uh, imagine if, even just from the the normal sea of, of power that was at the time. We're talking about Ravenna in terms of geographical closeness because of the of Odoacre, of the Goths, and, and later the same Byzantines and, and, and eventually the Longobards, albeit in the Po Valley, then in, in Pavia, I mean, then Constantinople, but also other capitals like Carthage, like Toledo, and also within the same goal, some different cultural areas like the south that was brutally romanized and you know dramatically prosper intellectually and, and economically at that point and the true intellectual center of gold that also informed dramatically in fact um the same merovingian court and ideology by medium also with um roman the the, the enormous roman cultural legacy of the papacy and so on um and so connecting, by the way, in the process, and we have seen it in the Merovingian kingdom, this Gallo-Roman-Germanic essence of, you can argue, the West at that point, right? Um, so something that was taking shape as a, a completely new uh, axis of power that is, in fact, what we will understand as Western. In late Roman times, and arguably even before, the West had already was already perceivable. Right, if you pick Italy, Gaul, Spain, in part even Britain, um, some parts of Germany, th there was this idea, yes, that there had been a, uh, still in, in Roman times, this broader tribal background that all these peoples essentially shared differently from the strictly political nature of Hellenic culture, how it had become to define itself after their own tribal times in um, after the Dorian invasions had somewhat uh, turned in, into that form. And so something importantly different, right? Not even Roman urbanism, in a sense, managed to, um, to, to surpass the fact that within the same Italy or in the other Western provinces, the, uh, this kind of barbarian element was the true essence of Rome herself, just by... In the European tradition, and um, and in this sense of of military religious uh, identity of of the West, but in Frankish times, this this of course you know a lot of water had passed under the bridges. This was a Christian reality um, that also importantly counterbalanced that strong military religious obsession because it acted as a you know, check and, and balancement to that in order to to allow civil development, which the Franks just by by their background were exactly not, you know, some of the most inclined people just to try that. Um but they they would still succeed. And this is what makes the same figure of Clovis so extraordinary because he understood that. He actively made and uh, uh, consciously made that choice to establish that building that again was um, to last in a broader even beyond its own national meaning so in a truly universal sense uh, till our day so um, the the process wasn't easy there was a lot uh, a long struggle right that passed through the same Clovis military history and his many victories and battles and bloodsheds, right? And meeting resistance of other peoples. They were crushed mercilessly um, under his sword. 
and to which the same conversion of Clovis, especially uh, against the Alemannia, the Battle of Tolbiac, really embodies that, right? The idea that the difference of a civilization is made by calling to this greater unitary universal power over the, uh, the battlefield by devoting oneself right to it um, and r allegedly reversing the tides right a bit like Constantine's vision of the cross before the Milbian bridges were a lot of parallelisms with that as well after which as you know Clovis simply converted and as a consequence all his retinue all his men did albeit as we have seen in a very imperfect way considering both still Frankish Christianity actually <laughs> still burst in the conditions of it by before the Carolingian ecclesiastical reform that we also often discuss in Schwerpunkt. Um, and but out of this struggle emerged was affirmed the most powerful among the Romano Germanic dominations. In fact, that one of the Merovingian Franks that was uh, about also to widen up to uh, build a true empire from the experiences of which Europe meant as area of a peculiar and dynamic civilization of finally world spread drew its first origin this is the most crucial aspect of that basically one cannot fully understand medieval history without properly realizing how the Franks achieved this that the Franks achieved this in the first place and that what we intend as a broader Frankish civilization that now we will define better would manage to, to take over and to define the West properly in the first place and to take over the world entire. Of course we're not talking about the mere Frankish dimension. One can argue that was reasonably a few that Franks, the Franks added to the civilizational structure per se. But the Franks brought in a moral force, the same one that Caesar, Tacitus, etc. had spotted among the Germanic peoples, essentially as their own kin, as the Romans had a very sound awareness of the common Indo-European um, religious military identity of of their ancestors and the the fact that a people capable of fighting for its own freedom and living in a primitive but still culturally coherent uh, fashion was was really a model to imitate and it, it is really what had brought the Romans to to rule over the other peoples in, in the same way so um, this Roman and Germanic identity at the same time is, is crucial to us that's also why I, as I said before I made videos about that because it's a concept without which probably even the same Western identity doesn't make any sense right uh, it's not just German or nor just Roman it's also other things one can observe this uh, say national Latinly meant um, identities as still the diversification of a common, in fact, origin. And this is the single most uh, sensible understanding of probably Western values that at that time did derive essentially from the steppes, conquerors over the, the Bronze Age civilization of the Great Mother and essentially inverted it with the virile, um, rational, Uranian domination o over the continent. And that's where everything, you know, uh, from the, the Atlantic world to the Celtic one, to the, in fact, the Roman uh, culture, to the Germanic one, 
really derived from in, in a broader sense and other peoples that we forget sometimes that, that shared uh, dramatically th the same values like uh, erase from your mindset the 19th century modernistic secularistic view of the romans as the colonialistic neo-nazis of the ancient world and the pure free uh, brave people of central europe that was stood they were basically the same thing and th this is core uh th this is a core concept without which westernness cannot exist because it, it, it there is no other possible identity in it so the entire history is founded on this cornerstone and uh good luck to, to interpret it without it by the way um and this is the point the frankish domination grafted on that gallo-roman world that already in late antique times was that point acquiring a central place in the latin west right gaul had um, essentially uh, stripped italy of the primacy right of broader development uh, and properly as a broader land mass in general in fact this is not just geographically meant of course but for the capacity demonstrated by the gallo-roman cities and aristocratic develop and, and you know also episcopal and monastic developments that were also quite highly refined and surely also in very strong contact with, with the same italy with the same rome at the time to re-elaborate and to redistribute actively the experiences of the mediterranean world that had surely permeated Gaul, right? We know of, I don't know, some chieftains of the Alamanni people that had fought at the time against Julian in fourth century. These people were pagan. They they acquired, for example, given that many of them lived like hostages in the same Roman Gaul, etc. Some cults, even as Serapis, that was venerated, saying Lugdunum, and they brought it with them. I mean, that commixtion did exist an important already but it was forged over time and, and a crucial aspect to realize about the franks especially that it was very often misconceived misunderstood is the fact that the franks however were not particularly romanized at all many people believe ah the franks lived uh, you know essentially on the rhine de Vesa, uh, so they were just at the frontier with the Roman Empire that they, they had centuries long ties with them, alliance, even wars that as as we know in general always hybridized cultures, etc. So they had to be kind of more Roman than say the gods that had remained just in the steppe uh for centuries and just arrived in the Balkans at some point after having also mixed with other peoples and having stayed more away from from Rome. This is absolutely wrong. The Franks actually were some of the least Romanized people, and especially there is no comparison with the Goths that surely were not as Romanized before coming in contact with Rome, but in the way they had, and exactly because they had received, compared to the to the early Germans, m many more influences from other, much many other peoples who were dramatically more hierarchized than than the germans such as the sarmatians and the huns that also had this kind of steps model of overlordship were much more easily uh co-optable by the romans and romanizable right their kings probably being raised in constantinople uh being properly instructed and modeled in, in this sense the difference with between the western and the eastern half of the empire is 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 very interesting because in a sense, the uh, the Goths were a bit more Byzantine than uh, maybe the influences that, in fact, the uh, that the Franks had uh, say the Franks had uh, were because of the influences received by the Gallo-Roman reality and, and others, right? So it's obvious, but there is simply no comparison. The Goths had already m showed the Germanic world kingship, which was absolutely untraditional to the Germans. And the Franks were exactly some of the furthermost from um, uh, from from the idea of king of of collective kingship than ever. The same 
salients were all scattered everywhere. The St. Clovis, as we we're saying, began from this, uh, from Tournai, from this uh, Roman, um, Gallo-Roman, and at uh, this point, importantly, Germanized uh, by certain extent cities that were, were this various chieftains installed themselves uh, uh, as federati and that ruled there as provincial um, kinglets, we, we could say, o always quarreling with each other, but being completely allergic to the concept of overlordship that instead the Merovingians affirmed with iron fist without any, and even surpassing effectively thanks to the fully the full um and the fully achieved uh, an immediate conversion from paganism to catholicism without passing terrarianism that the gods in fact had instead maintained and tried and were trying also in an anti-frankish and anti-byzantine function to maintain to manage the europe and the mediterranean through theodoric that had again this enormous amount of of power and based properly on, on, on a gothic Aryan axis that uh, and partly also pagan axis that was uh, quite fearful of the Merovingian experiment and the possibility of, of a Byzantine reconquest. But the Franks were none of that before the Merovingians. Um, we first of all come to know them in the third century as an unstable by the way, as it was typical for the Germans, league of, in fact, Germanic peoples that had coalesced in order to grant the success of deep incursions uh, from the lower Rhine within Roman Gaul. Most of the Germanic confederacies were designed exactly to achieve this objective, right? After the crisis that shook them, with the end of Swabian uh, hegemony from the northeast uh, of Germany. The system collapsed. That's also why the Romans, uh, early on at the time, tried a new expedition in Germany under Marcus Aurelius, and which you know didn't happen because the emperor died, and later also Maximinus invaded Germany, etc., to keep these peoples at bay that, however, realized because of the this greater... Uh, turbulence, greater instability, that the only way to survive, given that there were all kind of scattered tribes, was to, f to found other confederacies that could also and would also compete with one another, but also with the same Roman Empire, in order to gain more stability through loot and redistribution and this kind of things. Um, and the Franks were really the descendants mostly of the protagonists of the Battle of the Teutoburg force. They were mostly in, in Gaivonis, uh Germans, and they were among the least uh, developed in this sense, especially by the third century. Meaning that the northern and the western you go in terms of, you know, Germanic peoples, at the least uh, advanced they were. Right. In fact, the Goths were the most advanced, also because of the dramatic zootechnic capacities and. Um, uh, so political compaction they had acquired by you know incorporating the Sarmatians and this other pretty warlike and steps um, peoples with with a pregressed hierarchy and idea of or lordships and so on the the Franks the Saxons were even some of the least uh, in fact effective for this reasons among this these various peoples and um, this brought uh, initially to of course um, participating. Uh, in series to the the same divides occurring within the Roman Empire, right? Of course, the the Rhine Germans tried always uh, and obviously to push west, even that they just were on the boundary, and they also suffered important Roman retaliations. Um, but in this sense, they 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 suffered of the fact of uh, operating uh, without um, uh, coherence and and cohesion. Right, so alternating aggressions and alliances, also enlisting individually in the Roman army, which was kind of more way more typical than we think, where in fact some of them, including Clovis' father, reached the highest ranks of the military hierarchy, with expanding, you know, the, their influence uh, largely and politically in in Gaul. 
And, and up to that point, the broader Frankish purpose was simple after all. They didn't need to go at full war against uh, the Romans because it was just to, you know, uh, the Romans were habituated, of course, to, to instability on the frontiers because the world of that time was simply made like that. So they didn't have anything in particular against the Franks as a people overall. They mostly watched over the single chieftains. They tried to win some of them over to fight against the others. It was perfectly normal and it was, uh, we're also not particularly documented about this relatively smaller scale questions, but we know that, uh, in fact, the contact with Rome was quite intense. Um, and this brought, actually, most of the Franks traditionally to side with Rome, right? Uh, the Franks were not ideally just uh, Roman, uh, the, the Rome's best friends, the allies of the Romans. In general, nobody liked each other, just like today. Um, but they, they had found a, a way of coexisting in a relatively peaceful way, as, as long as, you know, the same Germanic or Roman stability allowed it uh, by some degree, which, considering also the old usurpations in Gaul, um, the clashes with the central government, you know, could change quickly, and so the Franks there were ready to capitalize upon it, vice versa. But the majority of them were fundamentally allies of the Romans. They were federati. Uh, so much that... As a wall, when in 406 um, the uh, tide of Vandals, Alans, Burgundians, etc., crossed the Rhine, famously enough, on uh, New Year's night, allegedly, on the frozen river, and swarming in Gaul, some, you know, the majority actually of Frankish uh, federati tribes, which were you know, there were Franks surely also from the other side, but they were solidly the majority that had already um, been settled by the Romans in some areas like the one of Cologne, uh, areas of, of the Rhine that had gone uh, depopulated more quickly. So the Romans were really okay in giving to, to the Franks that could use, let's say, um, to, to be a buffer state against these other Germanic movements. In fact, cooperated vigorously to the desperate defense of the Roman Rhine, because that had become the Frankish homeland. Uh, and, of course, they didn't want anyone invading it and or creating instability in Gaul, knowing that, of course, the, 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 the islands and these other peoples would have not really ruled Gaul as, as the Romans, uh, uh, that were an actual state, were. So the Franks would have lost at that point a lot, and... Um, they actually did temporarily, or at least the situation became more complicated for them, so much that the same Franks, at what seeing you know the, the Roman defense collapse, profited of the invasion, given that everybody was grabbing all the land they wanted. Okay, say, so why are we to be the, the last one of them if we, if we can? And so they expanded further, right, um, slowly, right, gradually because they were also more, you know, sedentary than these other peoples really were, like the Vandals, the Burgundians, also the Alani that were among them, or importantly already kind of Eastern influenced, right, as East Germans, or in part they were Elb Germans as well, there is this distinction very often just between West and East, but it was an important um, central element as well, but still they were peoples who were less habituated to relations with, with Rome and that already by themselves had a kind of a more nomadic mindset compared to this West Germans for the rest were particularly stable right they didn't move around the Franks carried out at some point in the third century a very long-ranging piracy even up to the Black Sea on Mediterranean etc uh, that is really relevant as well but they didn't move right the, the Vandals move a lot the, the Burgundians move a lot the Franks more or less were always there Right, they just moved a little bit across the Rhine and nothing else. Where the gods were globe trotters in many ways, and other peoples came even from more far away, like the Iranian uh, Alani that came, stemmed from the Caucasus, made a video that appar apparently is very appreciated about them. Um, and in fact, these peoples mostly were to leave Gaul, right, to move uh, in um, in Spain, eventually even in Africa. The, the Franks wouldn't wouldn't do that. They, they didn't probably even have the 
the political cohesion probably to to mount up a migration like that and it would have been just a bad investment because you know if you have already some solid bases locally why would you risk them for you know such a, a wide enterprise the, the, the hunts were pushing from the other side right so uh, that was the reason why also the other Germans had been on the move largely but not only and um, the Franks also would cope uh, with the Huns by by aligning with the Romans and fighting, in fact, together with them, the battle with Catalanian plains, etc. Um, as always, there were war bands of young men of this devotees, let's say, um, religious military brotherhoods of devotees that uh, roamed the world, literally going to fight who knows where. Many of them served in the Roman army, and we know them from, for example, from some Danish graves that they came back home and they wanted to be specified they had been Roman veterans in their memory so just think how deep even the attraction of of, of the roman empire really was um and uh the so there were franks from both sides at some point but the bulk was definitely in that sense pro roman right the, the visigoths were with rome the ostrogoths with the hans at that point uh etc um and this migration brought the franks also to reach to the boundaries of the territory occupied by the Alamanni, who were very similar to the Franks, um, practically indistinguishable. Even if you look at the material culture of these peoples, they mostly all belong to the broader uh, Rhine, uh, Thuringian, Central European kind of material culture. Right? They were pretty much all the same. It were, they were as stable as as the Franks, um, in a way, the Alamanni had essentially occupied that area. They, they were part of the Swabic uh, Confederacy region, so they were um, Alp Germans, like the like the Longobards, like the the Bavarians, and they and they had migrated southwest, and that's also part of the reason why the land um, they occupied that was basically the Agri Decumates, that was the only warm enough land uh, for the Romans to cultivate grapes, let's say, in um, in Germany still today. There is a lot of good wine coming from there. The Alamanni had seized it. it. It was this corner, essentially, at the conjunction of the springs of the Rhine and the Danube that the Romans had entered in to connect also a bit better, to uh, to smoothen a, little, uh, a bit more the corner f um, formed by the Limes on the uh, to rivers and that in spite being in fact also pretty much in contact with the Romans had and we know the the Alamannic women became pretty much Romanized in fashion as soon as they moved in the Agri de Comatis etc but the Alamanni as a people were much more anti-Roman traditionally um, they they were allies with the Romans at some point, but you know the, the battles of of Strasbourg against Julian, the defeats actually they had collected, but also the raids that they had carried out in the same Italy at some point, um, had made them somewhat more unavoidably, because differently from the Franks, they they had the Alps from the other side, so they had more more frontier opens with, open with the empire, but kind of more anti-Roman, and in fact the Alamanni were also more fiercely pagan, even in here. The Franks were too, kind of, but when Cl after, you know, we, we know that Clovis' conversion occurs because of the victory over the Alamanni um, on the middle of the Rhine. And um, at this point, we're still talking about this various Frankish shift and expanding, though. So, southwest up to the boundaries of the Seine basin, that would become essentially the, the border of Neustria that basically would account for um, an important part of northern Gallia Belgica, except Artmorica and some lands in the south that were kind of more Burgundian in nature. Um, and that word would, would be the, the core land of eventually of Merovingian power, because this was within the Roman Empire, where also the lands where the Romans had very accurately cultivated their own latifundia functionalized to the supplies of the Rhine legions that as you know in early imperial times had been the the largest military deployment the Romans 
uh, ever ever had um, in a single area and, and, and all this structure would fuel actually the later Frankish clientels in many ways also development of medieval heavy cavalry as we know because in Gaul in spite of these marauding peoples after all late antiquity was not destroyed by a major disruptive event like you know the gothic war in italy or the kind of we could say even a sort of social revolution in in um in um, roman britain after the romans left uh, however that redrew the boundaries and you know when the anglo-saxons created another model like the longbirds created another model in italy it was something more similar to spain where in fact the visigoths um, had an important amount of concentrated estates, except at that point they had not, con you know, coalized the country in a unitary sense like the Franks had managed to do, thanks to especially to the straight conversion to Catholicism. Um, and and Neustria would become the heartland of Frankish power, so much that Clovis established his capital, which is a big word, but still. Kind of as a more permanent seat of government. Guess where? Paris. Lutetia Parisiorum. Um, and that tells you a lot about properly the continuity that in Europe we, we've had with Frankish power, especially in France, it will what stem from there. Um, so this again was, I, I, as you understand, I'm eager to pass to Clovis' achievements, but let's say this is still still the face of the various chieftains expanding right also in agreement with the the roman authorities because the the system was collapsing so the, it, again it's the same local uh, populace that kind of at some point preferred easily the the franks to some other easternmost peoples and especially the huns uh, against which they they fought uh, atrociously but there was still a roman administration and a roman army like in fact, the center of Soissons in Clovis' times uh, with Siagrius, that was also kind of part of the um, Western Roman administrative territories that lived on after the deposition of Romulus Augustus by, by Odoacer in 476. Um, and um, this was, in fact, the main point that it was the sand basin as a. As a broader uh, properly pool of reason of demographic and agricultural resources that was organized by the time of Ricimer and of the last emperors of Ravenna the most important nucleus of the residual Gallo-Roman domination because Soissons was uh, an autonomous a completely autonomous military center and Soissons, that area and also in the closeness Paris would become here as a, as a broader basin, as a broader region in fact the heartland of Frankish power as they substituted themselves to the last Roman administration there, which is the base essentially of the Kingdom of France later on as Neustria this is crucial because you understand that while the heartland of Frankish power was was essentially uh, Austrasia that stretched uh, as far as the Weser. So we are talking even east of the Rhine, so in, properly in Germany, in areas that the, the Romans had not directly ruled, but yes, exercising an important influence for for a very, for half a millennium, but not uh, so areas that would, were much more similar to the ones inhabited by the Turingi, by the um, by the Alamanni, by uh, these other peoples that were kind of, even in mindset, kind of less Romanophile, right? But let's not stress at all the fact that the Franks were particularly more inclined towards Rome. They, they just were by convenience, as always. But there, were, there, there wasn't that difference. If you're going to search for a higher stratification of a hierarchical development of the Franks compared to other peoples because of closeness with Rome, it's Rome were really like the same thing. If you look at their armies, etc., they're, they're the same thing. They're identical to the Alamanni. What kind of difference do you think there is? Nothing. Um, 
it's exactly to this Soissons domination that through his military exploit in 486 Clovis, so one, as we've seen, of the kings um, of, uh, to which the Frankish grouping confederacy obeyed, put an end to. And I'm tempted to repeat the anecdote of the vase of Soissons that also strikes many of you, but it, that has mostly to do with the, eventually, the, the Christianization. This is like a Christian parabola, but still pretty bloody enough to, to understand what the point was there, how much Clovis was reliant of his own, probably his individual, I mean, he fought all, all his life, winning, clamorously. So this was an incredibly skilled, talented, charismatic, authoritative, capable uh, chieftain, leader, and king, right? So this, Clovis made the thing by blood. That's why you read the hymn of Benantius Fortunatus about Christ's passion in honor of, of Clovis, and you realize what that blood had actually meant. They had refounded their universal power through it, through the ultimate sacrifice. This was the same doctrine in the Christian and in the pagan world, the same, identical, they spoke the same language. The meaning universal was the same, was the cosmic struggle. Um, uh, Soissons vase, the Germans were habituated to win and cash their own loot autonomously, at least to put it together and then for logistical reasons and then to distribute it. And in theory, every man, there was, uh, see, they were allergic to a concept of hierarchy. If you had one, your share, you, you didn't have to obey anyone, there was no superstructure or some greater of over overlordship that could tell you what to do, which is important in motivational terms, but it's also detrimental in collective terms, the ones that you need to use for having, for example, an effective army with a functional discipline and the capacity of taking over all these lands and peoples. So there was this vase of Sasson by the local bishop that is uh, Remy, who would also baptize Clovis, and uh, hence from which the, the holy anointing of the, uh, of the French kings at, at Saint Remy, etc. And the, um, the, the question there is uh, he, that, that was a, a sacred uh, part of the sacred paraphernalia of the episcopate of Soissons. So he asked this charisma to Clovis, a man of arms, um, that would meet some men of, with a man of faith, whether the king could give back, restore the vase of Sasson to the bishopric. And Clovis listened to him, and when they, the Franks began to share the loot uh, before it, Clovis said, if you find this vase, like, take your loot, because it's owed to you. The Imperium gave it to you. But that vase I want for me, which w was an incredible overstepping compared to anything basically the Germans had believed up to that point. And so one, um, uh, one, one warrior, who was probably also some, some man of, of, of status among them, because already there was an important hierarchy and discipline within these peoples, still within their own, still tribal union. The word was not an egalitarian reality. The noblemen ruled over others, but they were accepted as such as long as they could have achieved that through their own force. And this guy sees the, the vase and says, ah, oh, yeah, you want the vase for you, and he smashed it with his axe. And Clovis didn't do it, and the, the thing was terrifying because that was going at war with Clovis as a person on insult, like what who the hell are you to, to pretend that you can have more than what you have deserved? And that's the point. How do you find the judgment of what people deserve? We we're just talking about it yesterday. There are people who see beyond and more, but they have to prove it. When he, uh, so Clovis actually gathered the fragments of 
of the ways of Soissons and with this act of piety gave it to the bishop who thanked him for this. Now one year later nothing had happened without any contingent reason. Clovis goes to this guy simply takes his sword out of his uh, scabbard uh, attached to his belt that the sword was of course the symbol of, of the man was the alter ego, his virility, his power, his manliness takes the sword and throws it on the ground the guy doesn't say anything while he bends to pick up the sword Clovis smashes his skull open with an axe blow and he says just like you did with the vase of Soissons and this is the story that means that there is a greater power than you imagine. And your lack of piety and especially blindness to it make you pay constantly. This naturally accords itself with original sin but also with the the original sin that existed in the pagan world conceptually the idea that mankind had been contaminated and deteriorated uh, because of its own moral uh, failure right uh, the the biblical tradition kind of almost hypothesized it in a sense of you know this had happened you couldn't do anything about that the pagan world was more possibilistic but still it was you know the absolute extreme uh, towards to tend which naturally could not be achieved so in practice the two religions were overlappable regarding it and Clovis founds on this idea the overlordship of Western civilization through a power that will fundamentally be a feudal one that will hegemonize Europe culturally and morally because there was no other force fundamentally here that was being used. Again, this was just a chieftain with a few hundred men under his command. No, no structural, material power, sophistication, technology. Th th these people did it just by cutting to pieces whoever they found in front of them. And that, that is what the Romans had seen in the Germans, that reminded themselves of, of what the Imperium was about and how they had achieved that themselves. It's about action and moral force, moral power. And when this gets combined with some more female, you know, sensitive element that, like the church was saying, okay, but now let's build something. Antagonistically, but cooperation at the same time. That's, you have, Western civilization this constant dialogue between papacy and empire, between secular and spiritual authority. This is the sap that made it. Other cultures didn't quite have the same concept because the balance was shattered, uh, mostly in one sense, right? The entire Indo-European culture is founded on the restoration, this moral power over the material contingencies of the world and those who think that because of them there's nothing that can't be done right just like uh, the left does today by saying you know all what matters is what sex you are what race you are that means you have lost the imperium before you even began because you live under a superstition which is what these people strive to emerge against the, the odds of mortality this is the very concept of it all is divine transfiguration just like Christ and the pagan heroes hence the blood of Christ's passion and the one that Clovis spilled of his enemies um, so in the following decades uh, Clovis consolidated the Frankish domination against the Thuringians against probably nothing personal given that uh, against the people itself but against their leaders given that he was half Thuringian himself um, as we've seen uh, as people inhabiting uh, 
the eastern borders of the Frankish settlement in the Germanic forests of the basins of the of the Vesa and the Elbe. Uh, the Franks arrived to the Vesa river and the, the, the Thuringians were from the other side up to the Elbe and the, at that point already the Slavic settlement. And also this probably Sarmatian settlement. We're talking about, um, excuse me, the, uh, the Alani settlement. We were talking about it, about the origins of the Serbs and the Sorbs who were next, just next to the Thuringians uh, last month. As we were saying before, importantly and famously enough, Clovis defeated the Alamanni. That were also actually a very powerful people. The, the Turingi, we made a video about them, were not that much. I mean, they, they, they were kind of a bit lesser people, a bit, bit like the Burgundians that at some point had been some powerful, uh, but that had been basically destroyed by the Romans on the middle of Rhine and deported to B to what we call Burgundy and probably also what the Nibelungen lead is reminiscent of, albeit he uses the Huns instead as the destroyers. Um, but the Alemanni were instead a fresh, uh, harsh and warlike people who was in turn in movement from the high and middle Rhine towards the north, so in the Frankish direction. And, it, and arguably, yes, uh, this became a matter of either the Franks or the Alemanni for the domination of, of Gaul. And it could have happened that the Alemanni would have made it their own way, and even their history would have been completely different in, in the West. But the Alemanni were crushed, and crushed badly, so much that they had in part to flee and take refuge in the Swiss Alps, in the valleys that were the boundaries with Italy, um, and that, uh, you know, Theodoric had uh, granted them as kind of colonial settlements exactly to to create a uh, you know, some uh, border frontier force to oppose to an eventual Merovingian expansion against the gods themselves. Uh, we should, I think I should remake that video about the topic. Because that, that's incredibly important. It opens your eyes about the migration here and its balance. It's, 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 it's exceptional. Remember, the Turingi were allies with, with Theodoric themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's the point I'm making. Clovis also intervened in the vicissitudes of the Burgundians, who were federati of the empire and rulers of the basin of the Rhone and of the Saône rivers. Um, and that were there just without presenting too much of a trouble. They began to, uh, at this point, they were actually under the, uh, the Ostrogoths themselves, just under Ostrogothic influence. And they tried to escape the Frankish pressure multiple times because the Burgundian terror, as we've seen, the Burgundians weren't very powerful, but they they were entrenched a bit in their mountains, in their valleys, and so it was not an easy ground where the the Franks mm, were attacking from, for the fr um, because they were a bit overstretching that direction, and it was difficult to make a headway, and especially considering that Provence was Gothic at that point. So. Um, you know, it was a risky affair, but uh, the Franks infiltrated, made a bit of proxy war, they tried to, to, to support this or this other Burgundian chieftain, right? And it's mostly after the collapse of the Goths that the Burgundians began to expand also a little bit southwest. Uh, but they would be included in the Frankish uh, Empire, and actually, and I made a video about this recently, what we call properly as the Merovingian Empire, and in part also the Carolingian one, is not properly just a Frankish Empire, but it's a, Burgund a Frankish Burgundian Empire. This is very interesting because the Burgundians were controlling, were, were less powerful, but they were culturally more influent. You see, they controlled these very deeply Romanized areas. They had uh, important revenues from their own valley and this connection with the with the Mediterranean. Uh, etc. And so in, in, in the northern part there wasn't really a, a true boundary with the Franks so they assimilated kind of and so the the ethnic body that came eventually to, to rule on the longer run was a kind of a Frankish Burgundian one by extent. Instead the say the Aquitanians, the Alamanni were more distant 
right? Instead, between the, the Burgundians and the Franks, it was a greater commixture, mostly also because of the fact of the continuity that had existed uh, with the Roman administration of the of the Gallia Belgica, but also the uh, Lugdunensis that, uh, in this sense, didn't have much of a boundary in between. But the Belgica especially made kind of like a crescent. It went from Armorica up to south, up to basically all the almost the Alps. So the Burgundians were close and they blended in the Franks and were also prosperous. It's a kind of a fertile area, you know, pretty blessed one ag agriculturally speaking. So they mixed more easily with them. And, and this cultural influence, even from a from a people that had had hadn't posed basically any threat to the Merovingian hegemony over Gaul is is very fascinating. Just to say one, the the, the Habsburgs themselves uh uh, we would be certain of it if we didn't lack just a, a ring in the, in the genealogical chain, but they, they came from the Romano-Burgundian nobility, by the way. In any case, um, the, the other main problem instead that was, uh, was really concrete in Gaul, because it basically occupied a, a large part of it, was the Visigothic one. Now, the Visigoths had um, an important role, of course, in, in Western Europe. At, at this point, they had been, however, under the hegemony of Ostrogothic Italy. In times of minority of the Visigothic king, um, Theodoric was, um, you know, his relative take this to this kind of vassalage of Spain, together with these other areas that he uh, you know, controlled from Italy that were basically everything up to the Danube River in the north to today's Bavaria essentially and the Noricum and the Dalmatia and Illyria and so on so a pretty massive size that could exercise even on the Visigoth as, uh, a certain influence and um, the Visigoths had remained kind of say had the Visigothic power straddled over Aquitaine and the Iberian Peninsula originally as you know the capital was Toulouse um, but uh, the Frankish victory at Rouillé over the Visigothic army brought uh, Aquitaine to be fundamentally severed from, from the Visigothic kingdom that retained north of the Pyrenees in the east just Septimania, in fact would remain importantly Visigothic in culture uh, historically. And given that Toledo was in a completely different reality also because uh, Spain already at that time had issues between what would become ideally like the Castilian center and the kind of the eastern Aragonese Catalonian periphery kind of couldn't do so much. I mean, they, they had already enough to do in the Iberian Peninsula to tame all the, the immense territory, the various peoples they inhabited, especially in the Celtic fringe in the north. Uh, there were this the web in, in the in the northwest between Galicia and uh, North uh, Portugal. So it, it was a um, a complicated task. The, the Franks basically sanctioned, and for the rest of the Middle Ages, their own hegemony uh, in, on Aquitaine as effectively the stronger power. We've seen it recently, also talking about the Duchy of Gascony, that was contended between the Franks and the Visigoths, but the Franks fundamentally being th the most powerful and having greater influence on the longer run, even though the area remained somewhat autonomous. Um, so this was yet another enormous blow, because by securing Aquitaine, that would always remain always autonomous from from the Frankish kingdom, in a sense, would ne was never culturally assimilated until in the 13th century the Capetians managed properly to occupy to secure it. And that wasn't over yet because the English, too, later on, exploited the local uh, revanchism and independent thoughts. Say, but um, it, it was still an area that was under Frankish sovereignty, and that that was recognized and accepted, and also contributing to the same Merovingian power through tributes, through you know wealth and etc. So. That was yet another another great success that allowed the Merovingians at that point to control this enormous 
enormous and incredibly fertile Atlantic region and beyond many uh, florid and uh, large river valleys uh, from the Pyrenees against uh, again to the basin right an enormous amount of people and land and agricultural resources that managed to consolidate the same Merovingian political institutional edifice that was founded importantly already on this very heavily hierarchical military clientels that from which eventually the Western feudalism would have evolved over the centuries from. Not bad for Franks that had, for Germanic people that had literally just come out of the forest a few generations before. And that was not even the most equestrian uh, bias, let's say. In fact, the Franks, by fair play, would always maintain the idea that uh, kind of more Eastern peoples like the Visigoths or the Longobards had originally had a, a greater equestrian capacity, which was true, right? But this was said uh, still in Carolingian times where effectively the Visigothic kingdom did not exist anymore, really, and the, the, the Longobard one was conquered by the same Franks, and where Frankish cavalry was already more, way more advanced than one of these peoples, or at least, you know, way more, you know, professionally oriented and very well supplied and um, and uh, consolidating that same political and social order that had created it. Uh, so that's where most also Westernness in a narrow sense stemmed from uh, in from early medieval times. Paris, as we were saying before, was chosen as Clovis residence. He became sole leader of the Franks. So founder of that territorial domination of the Merovingians from to take the name from the eponymous king of the dynasty Merovec but that literally means sea cow and would have been allegedly not just Clovis grandfather but also half human and half mar marine monster and so that hence the name and uh, that is complicated that uh, nobody really knows why but there was something about Germanic kingship connected to the waters um, originally and also probably some Frankish affinity with the Rhine and the North Sea and the Piracy as they had extensively carried out. There was something about that probably in the supernatural origin of the ancestor, even assuming he actually was, because the memory of these peoples was very short in a genealogical sense, but let's say conceptually conferred more prestige to the Merovingian house, right? And Merovac was, you know, the, the sense just the legendary chief of a, of a tribe of the Salian Franks in the fifth century. So whichever the reason, whether he was an amphibious monster, or maybe you know just an amphibious commando, uh, you know, um, a leader or something, which is possible considering the lands, by the way, and the kind of lifestyle this man had. Why? Why not? Um, brought to some kind of more ideological solidity this novelty of you know having a, a bloodline ruling the entire people which was incredible and and e even in the germanic mindset would have stamped it was that did care about the stock and the bloodline but had not known that kind of centralization because simply they didn't have any surplus historically in central europe to to, to rise to this kind of monarchic status um embodied in an imperium, uh, imperium sense that is properly in the sense uh, I achieved this, I factually did establish the largest power in Western Europe, uh, would have been uh, exalted to the point of saying it's my bloodline that made it. There is something within me that, that God has chosen to rule the world. Right. Um, and uh, as we were saying before, what is more remarkable is that the Franks, had they followed just their traditional customs by the death of Clovis in 511, should have forgotten this thing entirely. Instead, in spite of the fragmentation that occurred among the various Clovis children, this is the point, they remained Clovis children and 
the Merovingian bloodline ruled, kept ruling, not theoretically, but practically as a dynasty uh, over these various chunks of gold that were uh, basically also reunited at some point. The last uh, effective king was Dagobert, that because he reunited for dynastic reasons. In fact, they start being dynastic reasons, not merely kind of elective ones, right? But uh, really the one of a true king, uh, the Merovingian kingdom that remained, in spite of even, you know, even, uh, even to a point of fiction, but still you, the, the accomplishment of this bloodline had been so great that nobody would go against the idea. And it was also not much of an amazement per se, but the, the realization that this enormous power that was created could be inheritable. But it was everybody's interest, and especially one of the Ger German Gallo-Roman elites that had supported them to maintain the monarchy like that, especially in a country like Gold that, as we've seen, had preserved a great part of the hierarchy of the, um, of the large estates and therefore the, the previous um, uh, Celtic-Roman system that uh, you know, had made uh, the also the Roman civilization of Gaul, frankly, the most successful of, of, of all the provinces of the empire, right? Because of this important civil awareness and understanding, and also of mitigation of, of f blind fury and uh, into something more constructive, right? And, and there are some dark sides of this because this obsession for, for blood also brought two things that basically are not documented in any other Romano-Germanic country, such as the fact that the Merovingians would kill each other um, individually, exactly because of the bloodline. Children with their heads smashed on rocks just because they were the, children, the sons of your own brother, and you wanted you want to avoid them to rule in your stead and one of your, your descendants. So uh, this was unknown to other kind and that's also why a bit the black legion of the Merovingians emerged because these were actually pretty practical and logical and rational mechanisms um, but were also ruthless and for how much was at stake and other countries instead maintain a kind of a more more elective dimension but in a sense more more dysfunctional one with the due exceptions or at least not for rising to the same extent of power that the Merovingians had. Um, but this uh, system, as we were saying at the beginning, knew and succeeded, knew how to and succeeded in framing politically goal, goal specifically. So this enormous landmass of people and land for two centuries to essentially point pointing at the ways of the future expansion of the Carolingians in Europe. The Carolingians simply renewed this, this system once the, the Merovingian one had run out of steam and they managed to substitute themselves to it with a much also greater amount of uh, you know, strength in, in, in a sense um, because you know, something more advanced had been emerging gradually also towards a timidly subtle direction that in a world that was otherwise completely privatized in concept, including the Merovingian dynasty that considered the lands of conquest just as a private possession. So it was very difficult eventually also for the St. Carolingians to try to, to, to centralize and that's, um, that, that's how in fact they, the Carolingian Empire fell too, but not before having established, as we were seeing also recently, an incre incredible amount of um, uh, communal uh, force, especially in cultural educational terms, thanks to cooperation with the papacy, the ecclesiastical monastic reform, the script reform, that together with this privatistic system that was still, however, reminding itself of the existence of a public authority connected to a universal and sacred empire. There was a blend, a bit of Germanic stuff, a uh, of Roman stuff, a biblical stuff, etc. To make it very simple, 
and that was all functionally styled out in the Merovingian ideology and also the one of, of the Roman papacy. What we know as, again, the hardcore of the West, because from France it would spread everywhere, it would spread to England, to Sicily, uh, to, to Spain, right from the post Carolingian kingdoms, Western Francia, Eastern Francia, the Italic kingdom, this thing would expand every freaking where as we know as the um as the west and th that and these lands are properly the core of it altogether especially in, in carolingian times with the the boundaries that the carolingian empire assumes and that will c keep um spreading from this enormous uh, content of energies that were given a form right not just th because they were many as a substance but they had been formed according to that hierarchical model. And we could really spend an enormity in explaining the, the logic and also the rationale of this all. Why it happened at the time, but let's say, and how it happened. But in a sense, let's say the video is already atrociously long and you realize that uh, it has to do again with that religious military logic. You can't keep together people if you don't give them an authority and a discipline and a reason and a certainty and you you don't actually show them happening Clovis showed that happening it's just like the base of Chausson he accomplished what he had to accomplish they weren't just words they were facts they were actions they were risking life they was taking on responsibility this elite managed to enforce this as a reasonable option and as a continuity with the previous order that is also what essentially the uh, the same culture recognized at the time read gregory of tour and what he writes about clovis and is, is of course embellished but it's the key of it all Gaul had remained without a ruler the franks came made order this is an attitude that you meet with also in other areas like if you read, said this, there are some obscure sources in the very early 7th century in northern Italy, say, no, but the, the Longobards had have brought order, right? This we didn't have brought a, a, a stable government, a functional one, and of course these people were cooperating, like the Gallo Romans with with the Germans and making things work and making things work pretty well. That's the sap of what we call as Western in the synthesis of these cultures that became one to recognize them, ourselves in them today and this is crucial i can't stress this enough right and we'll probably be making other videos about it uh, because i really it's um it's sometimes puzzling to think that it happened it's not to, to be given for granted. Again, the St. Franks um, were, you know, just, you know, if Clovis had not been born, <laughs> like, we could say these things. I don't like what ifs, but you can Im immediately understand how differently just world history would have gone at the root. And I think what happened, frankly, and this adverb is not random, as I always say, it, is not necessarily the best thing could happen because there are always something better that can happen. But still, it's what we have. And considering how it's gone, I don't think it was that bad. And I would reflect, again, on the logic in the mindset of these people and how they made it happen. Why the decisive moral superiority of the of of the Merovingian subjects went towards their masters um, and in here you can read much more than whatever ideology whatever you know strange theory of how the world works or you know radical political doctrine or whatever it, it it's really reality as it happened not as you would have abstractly and wishfully thought to be right so it that's why history must be studied because it's not random 
people made it happen and there's always a reason for it in any case for today I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye